when someone comes in with this like low grade depression, like they're not suicidal or anything, but they just like don't feel like doing anything all day and are kind of bummed out and like aren't really happy and like not really motivated and they're just kind of like meh. Like a large percentage of those people, I'd say in my practice, like 10% of those people are like hypothyroid. I'm getting confused. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you guys a list, a constellation of symptoms. And then you guys let me know like whether this applies to you, okay? Problems with motivation. Problems with memory. Problems with executive function. So this is the ability to plan and implement long-term tasks, as well as delay gratification. Problems with attention. Problems with verbal fluency. Difficulty learning. Di uh, problems with psychomotor efficiency. So this kind of means like you could say feeling sluggish. Okay. So this is part of what we're going to do. So next up we have fatigue. Um, weight gain. Cold intolerance. Constipation. Dry skin. Muscle aches and menstrual irregularities. Okay. And then over here, we've also got anxiety, diarrhea, weak muscles. Over here, we have fatigue. And then over here, we have low energy, insomnia, low mood, low motivation, low enjoyment. And then lastly, we've got, let's say, fatigue, uh, quick to anger. Um, feeling sleepy during the day, poor quality sleep, as well as problems with motivation, executive function, things like that. Okay, so first question, chat is do these things apply to y'all? Okay. So like these, this is a collection of different medical conditions. And what we're going to do is some statistical. So the first thing is like, when I said I wasn't going to hold back, this is me not holding back. So if you guys are like, hey, this is a really long list of like lots of complicated things. Welcome to medical school chat. This is how you become a doctor. You memorize lists and lists and lists of clinical presentations. And then there's also like lab testing and figuring out what treatments are and stuff like that. But these are the things that, these are the constellations of symptoms, okay? So the first thing is like, who wants to guess? Like, what is category one? Anyone know? What's your guess for category one? Okay, good. So someone's guessing ADHD. Depression. What else we got? Lack of sleep, insomnia, anorexia. Oh. What a, a vitamin deficiency. Which vitamin, chat? We're in med school now. This is Twitch School of Medicine. Welcome, everyone. Dyslexia. Lupus. Vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin B12 deficiency. Right? Okay, so cool. Cool, chat. These are, this is so good. Like, look at all of these things that could be here. Thiamine deficiency. Good. Someone's, ooh, someone's like actually in medical school. Vitamin C deficiency. Autism. Okay, guess what, chat? All of these are wrong. This is type 2 diabetes. So what percentage of y'all are overweight? This is the consequence of insulin resistance. 
and high blood sugar. This is exact, so this is exactly what I'm saying. So all gamers should get their blood sugar checked. Okay, so next question chat. What percentage of people have type 2 diabetes? Do you guys know? Ah, see now, now the answers are all over the place. So this is 10% which means that nine out of 10 people are going to be healthy. And this is going to be important. This is going to come up next. Okay. So just because you're overweight, you may have some degree of, of insulin resistance. You may have some degree of like high blood sugar. You may have some of these symptoms, but what we're really talking about is 10% of people have type two diabetes. Okay. Next up, let's try again. So fatigue, weight gain, cold intolerance, constipation, dry skin, muscle aches, and menstrual irregularities. What do y'all think this is? I think it's globally. Okay, someone's talking about anemia. Hypothyroidism. Pots. Oh my god. Anxiety. Chat. Chat. Depression, IBS, Crohn's. Okay, so like, look, chat, listen to me. Listen to me. So a lot of these are really good answers. Pregnant. <laughs> that's good. So, you know, that's good. I'm glad someone mentioned pregnancy. So pregnancy, so one of the key things I learned in medical school is pregnancy is the one diagnosis you should, you can never afford to forget about. It's something that you always have to, I'm assuming you've got a female patient. Right. But like, it's the one thing you all like, you can never forget about pregnancy. You always have to think to yourself, is this person pregnant? Because it changes everything. It changes like, you know, because like medicines can be teratogenic. It can be weird. Borreliosis. No, it's not Borreliosis, but I like it. Uh, food intolerance. No. So the other thing, chat, is like, do you guys get that? These are these are all like good things that you should maybe get evaluated for. Right. Puberty? No, that's not a good one. Oh my god, these are great. This is so much better. Gout? No. So it's right. So you guys figured this one out. This is hypothyroidism. Okay. So now this is pretty interesting. So what do y'all think the right answer is hypothyroid? So now the question is what, uh, what, it was like the second answer too. Um, what, what percentage of the population do you think is hypothyroid? What do y'all think? Okay, so good. I think you guys are like doing better about this. So there's conflicting data. So this is where this is an important point that I have to share. So in my experience, there's like true hypothyroidism and then there's subclinical hypothyroidism. So the statistics around true hypothyroidism, some of them are like one out of 300, right? So really small, but others, other studies will suggest that hypothyroidism is closer to 3.7%. And this could be kind of in the subclinical range. So uh, the reason that I test TSH for all of my patients who have like fatigue and like basically depressive sy symptoms and like things like weight gain and menstrual ir irregularities is they may not have full blown hypothyroidism, but around, let's say 4%. So let's say 96 out of a hundred people are going to be totally fine. And 3.7% or 4% of people will have, may benefit some clinically from some kind of thyroid supplementation. Okay. So uh, can I explain what the thyroid is? Yeah. So the thyroid gland is like situated here in your neck and re releases something called thyroid hormone. And thyroid hormone does all kinds of things in your body. So the, the thing to remember about hormones is a hormone is a chemical signal that travels everywhere through your body. So the key thing about hormones is that they affect all of your organ systems because they go everywhere and they try to, they try to help your body work in concert. So another good example is adrenaline. Adrenaline is a hormone. So what is adrenaline on the effect? Uh, what effect does adrenaline have on the GI system? And so this is where I'd ask you, what does the body want to do? What does the GI system want to do when you're in a situation where adrenaline is released? 
the answer is that your body, your, your GI system wants to absolutely shut off, which is exactly what adrenaline does. Because if like, you don't want to be digesting food if you're like fighting against the lion, right? Like you don't want to worry about like forming stool and digesting things. You want to worry about survival. So if we look at adrenaline, it does things like increase your heart rate. It does things like increase your blood pressure. It uh, does things like makes your brain think in black and white and makes it think faster and more catastrophically. Um, it also does things like uh, shut off your GI system, essentially. You know, like all of like the slow stuff, like the rest and digest functions of your brain, like it doesn't want to mess with any of that stuff. It does things like vaso, uh, vasodilate, you know, the, the blood vessels that go to your lungs, increases your respiratory rate. So hormones are chemical compounds that travel throughout your body. And essentially they coordinate all of the body's response. They coordinate all of the different organ systems to sort of succeed at, at doing one thing. So thyroid hormone is kind of tricky because it does like a lot of different stuff. But essentially, like I kind of think about th the balance of thyroid hormone is like internally, like your yin and your yang. So for example, people in Northern climates, will have higher levels of thyroid hormone because thyroid hormone is one of the things that increases brown fat production. Brown fat is the is how you generate heat within your body. So if you look at people who are like, you know, in northern climates, they tend to have slightly higher levels of thyroid hormone. They tend to have more brown fat. They tend to burn more fat to maintain body temperature, which is also why it's kind of super interesting because if you look at obesity as it relates to different climates, the more equatorial climates are more prone to obesity and weight gain. And as you move north into colder climates, you tend to have people who overall tend to be a little bit thinner. And so if you look at hypothyroidism, it causes weight gain, causes cold intolerance. Whereas if you look at this one as hyperthyroidism, but this is considerably rarer. And so, you know, hypothyroidism causes constipation. Hyperthyroidism causes diarrhea. Hyperthyroidism causes anxiety. Um, and then like, you know, hypothyroidism basically causes like depression, symptoms of depression. And if you think about depression and anxiety, one is like a slow mind, one is an overactive mind. So thyroid hormone is really interesting because it affects all the different like organs in like really different ways. Yeah, so we'll get to the actual blood tests in a second, okay? So next up, I know it's kind of weird, but we've just got fatigue. What do y'all think this is? Are there medications for these? Yes, we're going to get, let's finish, let's finish diagnosing all these, then we'll go on and we'll talk about tired. IBS. Yeah, so you, so chronic fatigue syndrome, that's a new one. So we talked about B12, anemia. Okay. Uh, vitamin D, sure. HIV, sure, that's on there. It's actually a good guess. Insomnia. Myocarditis. Yes. It can absolutely present as fatigue. Burnout. Sure. There's a lot of stuff. So this, this one too. So this is B12 deficiency. So I like, this is the other thing about medicine. So this is, I mean, this isn't like, I mean, I'm sort of trying to simplify things, but also give you guys some, some stuff a little bit complicated. So the key thing about B12 deficiency is that it tends to not present as like a bunch of different random stuff. Like you're not going to see weight gain with B12 deficiency. You're not going to see like, uh, you know, dry skin or muscle atrophy or things like that. You may not see quite as much, um, you know, like, like the, the specificity of these deficits probably have to do with the high level of sugar in your like, uh, your vascular system and things like that. So you get like brain wide effects in uh, type two diabetes, which you may get fatigue and B12 deficiency, but you're not going to get quite like, you're not going to get like a verbal learning, like negative impact in B12 deficiency. So B12 deficiency, let me just see what, how common it is. Did I forget to look that? Oh yeah. I didn't even look this up. So I don't even know. It's rare though. So the, the thing is the B12 deficiency can sometimes uh, happen in people who are like vegans, but generally speaking, B12 deficiency is quite rare. I don't remember the exact statistics but it's something else to consider. Super easy lab test. Okay, next up we have um, low energy insomnia, low mood, low motivation. It's one out of 10,000. That makes sense. Because a lot of B12 comes from animal products. 
Um, yeah, so let's say, well, let's just say one out of 100. So 99 out of 100 people will be correct, will be fine. Okay? So low energy insomnia, low mood, low motivation, low enjoyment. What do y'all think? Depression, okay. Insomnia, okay. Parkinson's? Sometimes, actually, it's not a good... Alzheimer's, sure, so dementia. Low iron. Anemia. Genetic disorders, <laughs> nice chat. Dude, some real pog poggers out there. Trauma, fibromyalgia. Yeah, so this is the cool thing, chat. No, no. This is vitamin D deficiency. Now, vitamin D deficiency numbers are really interesting, okay? Because 5% of the population is vitamin D deficient, but 18% of the population has subclinical or less than normal. So there's like, with vitamin D deficiency, there's like ranges, right? So it's kind of like a bell curve. And so like, you know, this is actually like 18% of the population, and this is like 5% of the population. And so there's kind of like a subclinical level, and then there's like a clinically deficient level. And so the people who are like super clinically deficient, which is still 5% of the population, will have severe amounts of this. And about 20% of the population, by the way, I think maybe that the 18% number has something to do with using the internets and playing video games and not going outside. You think maybe it has something to do with watching the Twitch? What do you think? Right? So what this means is let's say that 80 out of 100 people don't have to worry about this. Okay? So this is, so what I really like about this is that you guys are picking up on a lot of different stuff. Right? Like, and like y'all could have any one of these things. Right? Like chat, you could be pregnant. Like you may have gout. <laughs> That's something I was expecting. Right? So anemia is another big one. I actually didn't even include anemia on the list. I kind of, it was on my other list, but. I thought that that would be covering too many things, right? So you could have all these things. I mean, or any of these things that people are tossing out. I didn't even talk about it. So the other thing, this is a spoiler alert, by the way. I don't know if you guys got this, but none of these are mental illnesses. Like, you guys get this? Like, these are not psychiatric diagnoses. That's the whole point of this lecture, is that all of these mental effects that we attribute to ADHD, anxiety, depression, I have trouble sleeping. The truth is that a lot of this stuff can be caused by physiologic things, and this is why you should go get a lab test. This is why you should go see your doctor. That's the whole point of this lecture. Okay, next up. Oh yeah, okay. So, what do y'all think about this one? Hmm? What, is the, what do you guys think? Fatigue, quick to anger, feeling sleepy during the day, poor quality sleep, motiv uh, problems with motivation, and problems with executive dysfunction. Malnutrition. Apnea, bipolar, okay, chlamydia is, I'm not even going to put that, gaming addiction, ADHD, alcoholism, so we already have apnea here, so we can say insomnia, sure, protein deficiency, Marijuana use. Yeah, so like this is the thing, right? So I want you guys to really pay attention to all of the things that you guys are talking about that are mental. So this one is sleep apnea. So someone got it. Good job. Okay? So I even I don't think I even remembered. Did I even... I don't have the prevalence of sleep apnea. What's the prevalence of sleep apnea? Epidemiology. Here we go. Okay, so this is interesting. So 15 to 30 percent, this is staggering in North America, in men, and about 10 to 15 percent in women. So this means that 80, let's just call it 80 out of 100 people will be totally fine. We didn't even get to anemia. So anemia also causes fatigue, primarily weakness. You know, you'll see like pale skin. Um, can sometimes cause, like, GI problems, right? 
and anemia is pretty common too. So let's see what the prevalence of anemia is. Uh, okay, what's the prevalence of anemia? Can someone find out for me? Let me look real quick. Oh, anemia affects 1.62 billion people. 24.8% of the population. That's staggering. So we're saying that about 75 out of 100 people are fine with this. Okay? So... Uh, that's globally, though. I suspect uh, I suspect that in developed countries, the prevalence is somewhat lower. Anemia also is more likely to affect women, primarily due to menstruation. Okay, so let's say this is globally. Uh, let's see. Let's see if we can find out in. Um, oh. Let's see. Uh, in the U.S. Um, so with the, the overall prevalence of anemia in the U.S. is about 5.6. But I don't know if you guys know this, but not everyone in chat is from the United States. Staggering. Or a developed country. Okay? So, here's the big takeaway. I want you guys to pay attention to, like, everyone who thought, like, oh, this is ADHD, this is anxiety... This is insomnia. Oh, Dr. K, how do I find motivation? How do I find this? How do I find that? You know, like these are the like, everyone's like, oh, I'm depressed. I'm anxious. The truth is that there's a physiologic likelihood of all of these things actually happening. Okay. So now what we're going to do, if somebody wants to help me do some math, is we're going to look at, so how, like, what's the, the, rough statistical analysis that we want to do to see how likely is any one of y'all to have none of these problems. Does that make sense? Because now like, okay, sure, we can say you have a 5% chance of this, 18% chance of this. And how do we kind of do this calculation, right? So what we have to do is we have to multiply 9 tenths for our first condition by 96 times 96 over 100 for our next condition times 99 over 100 times, let's use the subclinical number because that's what I think is actually really important in this population, 80 over 100 times, was that 80 over 100 again? Yeah. 80 over 100 times, and then you guys can decide whether we want to do 95 over 100. So who can do this for me? Right? So 9 times 9.6 times 9.9 .9 times 8, or 0.8. Sorry, hold on. 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9. What is this? It's 52%? Okay, so I want you guys to think about this. 52% of people have none of this, which means that any given person out there has a 48% chance of having one of these problems. Do you guys get that? So it doesn't matter. Right now, there are 4,335 people watching the stream. We may upload it to YouTube at that point. So if you're watching on YouTube, I want you to look at the total number of views that the video has, cut that number in half, and that is the number of people who watch this video who has one of these conditions, according to a rough statistical analysis. Do you guys get that? Like, this is huge. This is gigantic. And so if y'all have these problems, if you have difficulty with motivation, if you have difficulty with anhedonia, the inability to experience pleasure, if you feel tired during the day, if you feel weak, if you feel like you have difficulty with your memory, if you have difficulty planning and executing actions, following through is what executive function basically means. If you're constipated, if you have insomnia, if you're quick to anger, if you feel weak during the day, if you're a noob when you play Dota, you may have one of these conditions, right? So we're talking about type 2 diabetes, which can absolutely impair your, your negative function. Type 2 diabetes is really fascinating. So when you have a high level of insulin resistance, as you have a high level of insulin resistance, insulin is the hormone that causes your, your cells to take up 
blood sugar, right? So you remove blood sugar from the bloodstream. It goes into the cell, gets either used by the cell or, cell or stored as fat. So when you're resistant to insulin, it increases the amount of blood sugar traveling through your body. The unfortunate thing is that high levels of blood sugar traveling in your bloodstream is very, very bad for you. It causes all kinds of vascular damage because your blood, your, your blood vessels are not designed to have high levels of sugar like floating through them for a long time. So there are studies on type 2 diabetes which show that after 18 years of being a type 2 diabetic, you'll have all kinds of these like pro-dementia, like you'll lose limbs and things like that. Like I'm not kidding. It's not an exaggeration. But then people started to wonder, okay, what about, is it, it, is it a long-term effect? Or, or let's look at a shorter time span. So another study looked at four years. So if I'm, if I'm type 2 diabetic for four years, what kind of cognitive impact do I get? Turns out it's actually quite bad. Now, you won't get dementia, but there will be a lot of like temporary cognitive effects that will happen while like your, your blood sugar is high. And then people even did studies that were cross-sectional. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it just looks at a single point in time. So we take a thousand people and we measure their blood sugar and then we measure their cognitive capabilities and they still found impairment. No long-term effects, just one, uh, like a, a cross-section of young people. Actually, there may be some long-term damage in there because we don't know how long those people had high blood sugar levels. But I think the population was like, you know, young adults. So it's not even long-term effects, but even temporary effects of blood sugar are quite bad. Okay? So type 2 diabetes is like super prevalent. 10% of the population. Then we move on to, uh, you know, other things like hypothyroidism, I think, is a really good example of like a super silent problem that gets missed a lot, especially like the subclinical hypothyroidism, where they're not blatantly hypothyroid. They're not like, you know, their hair isn't falling out and things like that. That's what happens when your thyroid level is super low. But as it gets like, you know, as you get to subclinical levels, like not like a, a, you know, a complete deficiency, but like low levels, that's when we see this like low grade depression stuff is the best way I can describe it as a psychiatrist. When someone comes in with this like low grade depression, like they're not suicidal or anything, but they just like don't feel like doing anything all day and are kind of bummed out and like aren't really happy and like not really motivated and they're just kind of like meh. Like a large percentage of those people, I'd say in my practice, like 10% of those people are like hypothyroid. And I just start them on thyroid medication and they're like normal. They feel amazing. They're like, oh my God, I never realized that people like woke up every day and had energy. This is completely OP. Okay. Next up, hyperthyroidism. So that's quite rare, but that can be one of the causes of anxiety. So B12 deficiency is something that is also quite rare. So like maybe one out of 100 people or even less than that, I would imagine. But we are seeing increases in B12 deficiency, especially due to, um, you know, changes in diet. So like a lot of our B12 comes from animal products. There are some autoimmune conditions, which can also cause B12 deficiency, which I want to say I've seen more recently. I don't know if it's actually like on the rise. It's still something that's super easy to get checked. So just get it checked. And by the way, what you guys want to check in thyroid level is TSH. Um, and then we get to apnea. So this is another really common thing uh, that, oh, sorry, let's go to vitamin D levels next. So the next thing to check is vitamin D. So vitamin D levels are also associated with poor outcomes related to COVID, messes up your immune system, has a lot to do with calcium metabolism and like building bones and absorbing calcium from the gut and like all kinds of like random stuff. Vitamin D is made by sunlight. So when we get exposed to sunlight, our body takes that sunlight and constructs vitamin D out of it. People who have darker skin color tend to have a less efficient vitamin D production. So if you're like living in Scandinavia and you're like pale as snow, then you don't actually need that much sun exposure to make a lot of vitamin D. If you're from India or, you know, South America or something like that, at least the, you know, the equatorial parts of the world, or you're from Africa, you may need a higher amount of vitamin D uh, you know, sun exposure to create vitamin D. And that's just because in those climates, there's a lot of sun. So like our machinery doesn't need to be as efficient. Next up, we've got sleep apnea. This is the silent, silent, real problem, okay? So there isn't a lab, t uh, there's not like a blood test for sleep apnea. What you have to do is a sleep study. But the good news is that most sleep apnea is like, you know, you can kind of get through a good, to a good th diagnostic threshold through an interview. So like if you snore, if you have like a thick neck, I know it sounds kind of weird, but 
people who are overweight, people who snore a lot, people who have a thick neck, um, they can actually have sleep apnea. And in men, it's like 15 to 30% of men have this. That's like, it's nuts. And sleep apnea is basically like, you know, imagine playing a video game where you never get to like rest, right? Play Dark Souls without ever using a bonfire. And if you play Dark Souls without ever using a bonfire, that is what ha living life with sleep nap apnea is like. You never get to, like, you never get back to 100%. And so sleep apnea is one of the most, it, it, the problem is that people can function. Like, people are awesome, right? Like, you are a Chad at Dark Souls, and you're so awesome, and you're so skilled, but boy, is the game, like, super hard. Like, life is just hard when you have sleep apnea. You can hold a job, you can kind of study, but, like, it just doesn't, like, your brain is like a colander, and knowledge just leaks out of it, right? It just doesn't store things. You feel tired all the time, you get sleepy, you're, like, kind of yawning all day and, like, pounding, like, coffee and stuff like that. And then you fall asleep at night, and then, like, you wake up and you don't feel rested. So you can discover a lot of this stuff in a clinical interview, which is why you guys should go see a doctor. You can do a sleep study, then if you get on a CPAP, which is a, a continuous positive airway pressure machine, it'll prevent you from being apneic and you'll wake up and you'll feel rested in the morning, which is also like super OP, the ability to feel rested. If y'all don't feel rested in the morning, you're living life on hard mode. Anemia is the next one. So anemia is a good example. Like, you know, so sometimes we'll, uh, you know, women are sometimes more prone to it because they menstruate. Um, you know, but anyone can be anemic. Generally speaking, in developed countries, it tends to be like lower because we have high consumption of like meat intake and other sources of like healthy iron. So anemia is an iron deficiency or, or a, a lack of red blood cells in your body. So blood cells are like literally carry oxygen to all of your the different parts of your body. So it's basically like your fuel delivery system. And so what that means when you're anemic is that like your body is not getting enough fuel to function properly. So people feel super tired. They feel like weak and things like that. So everyone, you know, nowadays is like, oh, I feel owned, right? Like I'm just like, I'm just owned today. Like I don't feel like doing anything. There's a lot of physiologic things that can contribute to this. And this is something I've learned the hard way is like a lot of these people in esports, like they have these problems too. So I want you guys to think about this. Unless all of the, you think about your favorite team and like ask yourself, do these people have a team doctor? When was the last time they saw a doctor? When was the last time they had a blood test? Because if the answer was like, it was five years ago, there is like a 48% chance that they have one of these problems. That is a staggering, it's not a perfect way to look at statistics because, you know, you can have more than one and things like that. And some people are, you know. Um, and so like, it's staggering, like 48% of people will have one of these problems. So 48% of like people in chat will potentially have one of these problems. 48% of people who watch this video so take the number of views, cut it in half, and that's how many people have these problems. It's crazy. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of improving your life. Has nothing to do with 99% of what Dr. K talks about. Has nothing to do with finding your inner whatever. Has nothing to do with like stages of change. Has nothing to do with ins insomnia. Has nothing to do with depression. Nothing to do with anxiety. Nothing to do with like some scars. Nothing to do with meditation. Meditation ain't gonna fix this, by the way. It has nothing to do with any of this stuff. It's physiologic. And what I want you all to appreciate is when I show you the list of these symptoms, everyone's tossing out psychiatric diagnoses. Everyone is tossing out psychiatric diagnoses. Oh, it's ADHD, it's depression, it's anxiety. This is part of the problem with, I think, mental health in this country. Why is mental health getting worse despite the fact that medical science is advancing? It's because a lot of our mental health providers have no training in physical medicine. Think about that for a second, right? So the average psychologist or social worker gets trained in all kinds of stuff that we actually get less training in. They're actually really good at that kind of stuff. They actually get more training in psychotherapy than an MD does. But 48% of people that walk into their office will have one of these conditions. And generally speaking, I, when I think about the average therapist, I don't think they're writing lab slips, right? So it's like kind of problematic. Anyway, it's not really their responsibility because your, I, uh, you know, your primary care physician should be taking care of this stuff for you, right? So your GP or general practitioner, like your, your just run of the mill doctor should be evaluating for this stuff. But as a psychiatrist, I want to say that there's a staggering number of people who walk into my office thinking they have a mental health problem and it turns out to be a physiologic problem. And then you just start them on the right medication and it's like, 
they're fine. And sometimes it's not even medication, right? In the case of CPAP, it can be, it's like a machine. In the case of type 2 diabetes, it can be like dietary change and exercise. In the case of anemia, it can be dietary change. So you don't even need medication for this stuff. In the case of thyroid hormone, you usually need, you know, medication for that. But questions? Is it okay to go to a psychiatrist? Yeah. So a psychiatrist is really the one that you should hold responsible if they miss something like this, to be honest, because they're the ones who actually get trained in it, right? So social workers and like psychologists don't do it, aren't trained in physical differential diagnosis. They're trained in like psychiatric differential diagnosis, and they're really good at that. Do you need medication for subclinical hypothyroidism? You can. That's why you should talk to your doctor about it, right? So it really depends. If you're having symptoms, what I would sort of recommend, like I'll treat people with subclinical hypothyroidism with medication. Usually. I'll give it a shot. If they're having the, cl the clinical symptoms and it's like, they're like, yeah, I feel like owned all the time. It's like, okay, let's start you on a super low dose and see if it helps. And some of them come in and they say like, yeah, it's not really helping. We can add a little bit more. We like recheck their levels. And that's like the practice of medicine. So you guys should really go, it's not just like a legal disclaimer. I'm telling y'all that if you guys are suffering from this stuff, go and actually see a doctor because they can help you with these things. Y'all don't have to play Dark Souls on hardcore mode. Like you just don't have to, you shouldn't play life on hardcore mode because you just have one, it's hardcore anyway. You only get one shot at it. So like you got to play it as best as you can and optimize everything. Does weight loss help with uh, snoring and sleep apnea? Absolutely. Yeah, but I'm a gamer. So, so that's a great point, Trig Etheridge. That's literally why we're doing this lecture. Being a gamer is no longer an excuse. You guys deserve better. This idea of the degenerate gamer is like the lowest common denominator that I also fall into, assuming like, ha, 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 the gamers, like, they're not going to go, like, do anything. Ha, ha, they're gamers. They're just energy drinks and being, no, like, go outside. Like, go see a doctor. Like, you deserve better, dude. You can be a gamer. Like, that's why we're a healthy gamer. We're not, like, abstinence from gaming. We're, like, just, like, go and see a doctor, like, one day out of the year. Go and do a one-hour appointment with a doctor out of 365 days in the year. Go get it. You spend a second hour, like 15, 20 minutes getting a blood test. 15, 20 minutes talking to your doctor, getting a prescription for maybe like hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. Go pick it up, take your pill every day, and then play LOL for eight hours a day. That's fine. Like, I'm not saying, I'm just saying like use two or three hours over the entire year. And then continue being your degenerate gamer self. Like, that's all it takes. And then the cool thing is you'll be more motivated. So then, like, it'll be easier to stop playing whatever you're playing. Yeah, so <laughs> someone's saying, I'm in the pre-contemplative stage of seeing a, a doctor. Absolutely, dude. That's why this is awareness raising, right? So well said. Someone's paying attention, chat. Yeah, encouraging everyday drug use while also maintaining other drugs like cannabis is bad every day? Absolutely, man. Because I know this is kind of weird. So people are like, oh, like, he's encouraging drug use and like, but this is drugs. So I know this is kind of weird, but what I'm basing it on is this thing called science, right? Where we can do studies and we can take people who have sleep apnea, who are literally, for those of you who don't know what, uh, I mean, I guess there isn't a medication for sleep apnea, so maybe it's a bad uh, recommendation, a bad choice. But like the, the other thing about a lot of these is that you don't need medication for them, right? But like that's why we use science. Like we use science to evaluate objectively what is the crap that you're going to put in your mouth? Like what is the pill you're going to take? And like what are the benefits and what are the hindrances? And so you should absolutely be scientific about it. I'm not just advocating it. I'm not saying all drugs are created equally. I'm not taking telling people to take like chemotherapy out here, right? Because chemotherapy is way more damaging than cannabis, and yet it is still sometimes an appropriate recommendation. So it's about like understanding science and understanding who you are. And instead of like some kind of resistance to like, I, I, it's a, a statement of resistance that I can advocate for some drugs and not advocate for others. Yes, that is like literally my job is people come to me and I will advocate for some drugs depending on their situation and say like, yeah, maybe you shouldn't take that. Right? It's like, hmm. If someone comes into my office and is hypothyroid, 
I'm not going to recommend that they take birth control, right? Because it's like, especially if it's a dude, it's like, it's not going to help you. Drugs have their time and their place and cannabis is included. We talked about that. There's a time and place for cannabis, but generally speaking, it tends to be used recreationally. So do I have to quit smoking cannabis? See, there is a pre-contemplative statement. Do I have to? No, you don't have to. You don't have to. Like no one's, I mean, like, I don't know what the legal situation is, where you live and where you are and what the availability is. It's just, you don't have to. The question is like, what's it doing for you? And how is it hurting you? That's the real way. Like, even when it comes to gaming, right? It's like, we're not saying you should be abstinent from all gaming. Like we even, like I play games on stream, but I don't, you know, today, instead of playing Dota, which I would love to do, because by the way, there's a new hero, new patch. So it's very exciting, but it's like doing what's important, right? So like, what's more important, like teaching chat that 48% of y'all may have one of these problems or like playing one game of Dota because the cost is the same. It's one hour of my time. So no, I mean, no one has to give up marijuana. Like I've had patients who are dying of like alcoholic liver disease and they don't want to give up alcohol. Like that, it's your choice, right? I'm not going to make you do it. I don't think it's the right one. You know, your kids will miss you, but it's ultimately, it's like your choice. You're the one who has to decide what to put into your body. And I, I've seen this choice on the other end of the spectrum too, where like sometimes I'll have patients with schizophrenia and I like prescribe clozapine and boy, is that a tough choice. It's a tough choice in the opposite direction. This is a medication that will cause you to gain 80 pounds. You will literally start drooling and it will be hard for you to write poetry. The upside is that your delusions will stop. Your hallucinations will stop. You'll be able to like wake up at a decent hour on a daily basis and be able to interact with other human beings. And I've had some patients who are like, yeah, like I'd rather, I'd rather take the poetry and get hospitalized four times a year. And I've had other patients who are like, it's really sucks. I'm really sad. I'm, it sucks that I have to take this medication, but I think I want to stay out of the hospital and like be able to have a dog. Cause when I go to the hospital, there's no one to take care of my dog. It's tough. It's really tough. So I, I think it's, but that's, I mean, that's medicine and that's life. Like, I don't know that there's ever, you know, an always good choice. The closest thing I can think of <clears throat> in terms of an intervention that works for just about every human being is meditation, which is precisely why I teach it at the end of like most streams. Okay. Okay.